Welcome. Oh, to Dr. Bruce McCormack, whom we're very pleased is here, and he's had a three-day rest. We're ready to go. I, I hope you all had as good a weekend as I did. This was probably the first time I've taken three days off in months, certainly, if not years. Um, I had a great day on Friday, um, getting down in the city with the Van Hoosers, the uh, Sweeney's, the Maduemas, and some others, seeing a play, which interestingly enough, it was on Mark Rothko, the Jewish painter, lived in New York City, and there were a lot of parallels to my own thinking uh, that emerged in the course of their dialogue, which I found very interesting. And got a chance to uh, um, have a good conversation with Tom on Friday morning, uh, time of prayer, and found out that Tom and I share a lot in common in terms of background. He and I both are from the western states. We uh, are both horse people. Uh, by upbringing. We both are support supporters of the Boise State Broncos and Notre Dame football. <laughs> so metaphysics notwithstanding, we have a lot in common. <laughs> the really important stuff. Uh, and then I got a chance to uh, spend the day yesterday with Kevin and Sylvie and really enjoy worship together. And it was great to renew a fellowship that began 20 years ago as colleagues in Edinburgh. And I'm very grateful to be here. Let me begin today. I thought I'd just try to remind us where we are in the flow of these lectures and to locate what I'm doing today. The second and, and third lectures, the historical lectures, offered what I hope was a careful explanation of what metaphysics is, that is, what is fundamental to it in all of its forms. They also explained the role played by metaphysics in the construction of the orthodox doctrines of the Trinity and of Christ's person, though with respect to the latter, I'll have much more to say today. I also suggested that it is possible to do theological ontology without resorting to the use of metaphysics, and I hope to make that claim good today. In the lecture on the New Testament on Thursday, my claim was that the apostolic writers did not engage in any kind of direct metaphysical reflection on divine being. I defended this claim by showing what they did do, namely to reflect on what the exaltation of Christ means for the Christian understanding of divine identity. I pointed out that there is no abstract conception of a logos a sarkos in the New Testament. The logos a sarkos is consistently named. His name is Jesus Christ. My goal in this lecture is to set forth an understanding of the ontological constitution of the mediator, what classically was called the person of Christ, which will explain that state of affairs. So the title of this lecture is Which Christology? Refining the Economic Basis of the Christian Doctrine of God. What does it mean to do theology under the conditions of modernity? The answer to that question is far more complex than is often realized. Casual critics of modernity will often assume that it means capitulation to some modern philosophy or another with deleterious effects for Christian theology. But the intellectual conditions brought on by the rise of modernity comprehend far more than changes in, in, in philosophical outlook. They include revolutionary changes in the natural sciences, in comprehension of the history of, world, of the world and geography, and even in mathematics. Philosophy has tended to follow along after changes in these disciplines, adjusting itself to the requirements of expanding knowledge in all of those fields. Where Christology is concerned, one of the principal challenges in the 19th century for those committed to Chalcedonian orthodoxy was the gradual emergence in inchoate form of the discipline we now call developmental psychology. By the 1840s, the question had become pressing. Did Jesus of Nazareth experience emotional development and maturation? Is that what's included in growth in knowledge and in grace? Did his self-understanding grow and possibly change over time? It doesn't really matter that the New Testament does not give us precise information in relation to such questions. Behind them lay a theological problem of significant proportions. What the bishops at Chalcedon affirmed at the end of the day was the single subject Christology of Cyril of Alexandria, 
and they equated that subject with the person of the Logos so that the human nature assumed could be regarded as a subject, could not be regarded as a subject in its own right. That's the fundamental meaning of the ancient term on hypostasia that emerged in the aftermath of Chalcedon. The human nature assumed could not be regarded as a subject in its own right. And so long as the full and complete humanity of this nature was guaranteed by the merely formal ascription to it of a rational soul and body, there was no real impediment to understanding the relation of the person of the union to the human nature in terms of an instrumentalization of the latter. But add to this formal description the material content of emotional maturation and growth in self-understanding as occurred in the 19th century, and the human nature begins to look more and more like a thinking and willing human subject. How then, under these circumstances, is it possible to avoid a drift in the direction of the two subjects Christology of, of, of the Nestorians? It may well be that virtually the whole of modern Christology is Nestorian in some sense or another, but how could that really have been avoided? Even more importantly, once it had been recognized that full humanity is not simply a matter of possessing certain faculties, but of actually engaging in mental and physical activities, is not the Jesus portrayed in the Gospels a human subject whose work is done in the same way you and I would have to do it had we been called to do so, namely in the power of the Holy Spirit? Was the Nestorian drift of modern Christology not finally unavoidable? Can any of us today avoid it without walling ourselves off against the implications of Jesus' self-consciousness in its lived history? I have put this matter as forcefully as I can, not because I think there's no way out of this dilemma. I actually think there is, though the way out is not obvious. But I put the question forcefully because when confronted by the challenges of, of the modern sciences, physical, psychological, and social. Most Protestants these days quickly become functional Catholics. That is to say, most retreat inside the secure walls of ecclesial authority, simply reciting the official teachings of the ecumenical church as if they were irreformable in the fully Catholic sense, while questioning the Christian character of anyone who has the temerity to raise questions about them. A head in the sand approach is not going to help. For modernity did not create the problems resident in the Chalcedonian definition. They were there all along. Modernity has merely intensified them, making them impossible to ignore. In what follows, I am going to begin with Cyril of Alexandria and the Council of Chalcedon. Though Cyril did not live to see this great council, those who emerged from it as victors in the great controversy Cyril had been engaged in were his followers. Discussion of Cyril will also give me occasion to introduce the theme of kenosis, which has been called a master theme in Cyril's theology. In the second major section of this lecture, I will briefly treat the kenotic movement of the 19th century, the greatest attempt to, to date to save the Chalcedonian formula from challenges both internal and external. In a third and final section, I will set forth my own Christological proposal which will then provide the basis for my reconstruction of the doctrine of the Trinity in the sixth lecture later this afternoon, and a selection of divine attributes in the seventh lecture tomorrow. OK, to begin then, major section one, who is the subject? The promise and peril of Cyrilline theology. The word subject is, of course, a modern one. We use it to describe a person in the sense of a fully self-conscious, rational agent of willed activity. The ancients used the word person, too, but they meant something rather different by it. In its origins, prosopon referred to the mask that actors wore on a stage. 
Hence, person referred to how the one standing next to you presented herself to you, how she appeared to you. The reality behind that appearance could certainly be spoken of, at least in formal terms, in terms of the faculties she possessed. But who she truly is was understood to be a matter of self-disclosure. So if we were to try to map the modern concept of the subject onto Cyril's reflections on Christ, what then would be the result? Who or what is the subject in Cyril's Christology? Is it what we might think of today as the performative agent? Or is it something else? I want to suggest that Cyril has both an explicit and an implied answer to these questions, which are not obviously compatible. We may begin with the explicit answer. According to John McGuckin, Cyril stands in a line of reflection that begins with Apollinaris. The Christological problem as confronted by Apollinaris in the late fourth century had been, in McGuckin's words, how to avoid a doctrine of two subjects in the incarnation on the one hand, and on the other hand, a single subject doctrine which would hopeless, hopelessly relativize the logos in a changeable human life." Unquote. Apollinaris' solution was, of course, to replace the hum human noose or mind of Jesus with the logos. Gregory of Nazianzen's famous axiom, the unassumed is the unhealed, quickly put an end to this model. But the basic tendency to Apollinaris' thinking was not so easily eradicated. The basic tendency was to instrumentalize the human nature. That was, in fact, the entire point in making the Logos to be the directing principle or hegemonicon of Jesus' flesh, which in one form or another is an idea basic to all divinization soteriologies and not just to that of Apollinaris. Parenthetically, I don't think it's at all unusual or surprising that Sergei Bulgakov would spend time in his Lamb of God defending the orthodoxy of Apollinaris. Apollinaris is, at the end of the day, very important for the construction of divinization soteriologies. You don't have to make his crude mistake of truncating human nature, but you do need to instrumentalize the human nature, and that's what he was fundamentally after. For Cyril, coming as he did after Gregory of Nazianzus, the Christological problem now became that of explaining, again in McGuckin's words, how the existence of a human soul in Christ could be reconciled with a single subject, Christology. His answer was more subtle than that of Apollinaris, but it was along the same lines. McGuckin puts it this way, and I quote, the human nature is not conceived by Cyril as an independently acting dynamic that is to say, a distinct human person who self-activates, but as the manner of action of an independent and omnipotent power, that of the Logos. And to the Logos alone can be attributed the authorship of and responsibility for all of its actions. This last principle is the flagship of Cyril's whole argument. There can only be one creative subject, one personal reality in the incarnate Lord. And that subject is the divine Logos who has made a human nature his own." Unquote. So not only the flesh of Jesus, but his soul as well, which means, of course, also his mind, are taken together the instrument of the Logos to move when and as he will. McGuckin expresses this point in wonderfully vivid language. The whole nature, the human nature as a whole, is, he says, the economic instrument of the Logos. The human nature of the Logos is therefore an instrument of the divine energy. In its union with Godhead, as in the dynamic act of incarnation, the human nature of the Logos thereby becomes an instrument of omnipotent power and thus in a real, though paradoxical sense, an omnipotent instrument." Unquote. 
Thus, on this showing, the performative agent of all that is done by the God-human in his divine human unity is the person of the Logos. Now that's Cyril's explicit answer to the question of who the subject is. The implicit answer, which stands in a decided tension with the explicit answer, begins to emerge in Cyril's discussion of the doctrine of appropriations. To appropriate, as we saw last week, is to make something one's own. In the case of the Logos, to make the body in which Jesus suffered to be his own. We already examined this idea in Lecture 2 in Athanasius' thinking, and the train of thought here is precisely the same. The body of Jesus belongs to the Logos. Therefore, what takes place in it may rightly be said to be his in a possessive sense. And so McGuckin can say, for example, quote, God suffers insofar as his own body suffers. He does not suffer in his deity, but he does suffer in his humanity, which he has appropriated as his own, unquote. He nevertheless insists that, quote, the word is the direct personal subject of all the acts and experiences of his own life, whether that life is lived out in the condition of deity or humanity, unquote. A claim which might seem to render the impassibility of Christ's divine nature an impossibility. But appropriation is not a realistically conceived communication of the attributes of human nature and the experiences they make possible to the person of the word. It's a figure of speech, which at the end of the day expresses possession. And the reason for this is that the dynamic interpenetration of the humanity of Christ by the divine word results in traffic that moves in one direction only, namely from the divine to the human, as is clear from the analogy Cyril employs, such as, a, a, as fire in a piece of iron. The point of such analogies is that Christ's humanity is suffused with deity. Cyril's ultimate interest in all of this is to be found in his divinization soteriology. A soteriology whose mechanism is to be found in the idea of a participation of the humanity of Christ in the immortality and impassibility of the divine nature. Something that would be impossible if either immortality or impassibility were qualified or set aside by the hypostatic union. That's why the traffic can only move from the divine to the human. Appropriation, when seen against this background of commitments, cannot consist, simply cannot consist, in a realistic communication of human attributes to the person of the word. Appropriation simply has to be figural. Suffering remains confined to the human nature, to anticipate the language of Chalcedon, even as it is said to be his, that is to belong to the Logos. And so the word does not suffer in his own nature, but rather in the body he assumed. And so McGuckin concludes, Cyril says he suffers impassably. That certainly does not mean it's play acting. It means he does suffer, but he does so qua man, not qua God. His divine impassibility is not affected, unquote. If then we were to speak at all of a communication of human attributes to a subject, how would we now understand this subject? I want to suggest that on the soil of Cyril's Christology and above all his soteriology, such communication would have to be to the whole Christ. That is to say, the God human in his divine human unity, the totus Christus, rather than to the Logos as such. To the extent that figural communication strives to become a wee bit more realistic, this is the only possible outcome, given the commitment to divine impassibility. This is what is meant by making the God enfleshed within history, to use McGuckin's phrase, to be the subject of Christ's sufferings. Human predicates are rightly ascribed, even realistically ascribed, to the Logos, but to the Logos according to his human nature. In this way, 
human attributes remain attributes of the human nature alone. They are not made to be attributes of the Logos as such. But it's also worth pointing out that a subtle shift in subject has occurred here. When Cyril's speaking in terms of the performative agent of all Christ does, when he's thinking along the lines of his divinization, soteriology, the subject is the Logos as such, the pre-existent eternal Logos, the Logos as sarkos. But when he speaks in terms of what would later be described as the communication of attributes, the subject to whom human attributes are ascribed is the whole Christ, divine and human, the Logos and sarkos. This tension between the explicit answer and the implicit answer to the question, who or what is the subject, would continue to plague the work of post-Chalcedonian theologians like John of Damascus and would become a contentious issue between the Lutherans and the Reformed in the 16th century. The Lutherans would lay all of their weight on the explicit answer and thus favor a communication of divine attributes to the human nature of Christ. The Reformed, on the other hand, would emphasize a communication of attributes to the whole Christ so that divine attributes remain proper to the divine nature alone and human attributes proper to the human nature alone. What I'm suggesting is, depending on which problem is, is before the house, in this case for Cyril, whether it's the question of who's the performative agent or who is the subject to whom attributes are ascribed, the answer given to the question who's the subject changes. In one case, it's the Logos as such. In the other case, it's the whole Christ. How then is the divine self-emptying understood by Cyril? McGuckin says, the Logos assumed a human life and all the relativized conditions that are applicable to that. The subject is unchanged, unchanged, the divine Logos, but that subject now expresses the characteristics of his divinely powerful condition in and through the medium of a passable and fragile condition. Cyril, by preference, calls this economy a kenosis, or self-emptying, following the terms of Philippians 2, 6 through 11, a central text in the debate with Nestorius, unquote. What Khaled Anatolios has called the active-passive paradigm is clearly operative here. It's the Logos who acts upon the human nature, which is passive, making it to be expressive of his divine power to overcome suffering and death. Self-emptying, so understood, takes place by means of the addition of a medium through which to act in this world, an act of condescension which leads to a certain loss of recognizability and thereby of the glory and honor rightly due to the Logos from those to whom he came. What kenosis is not on this showing is an act whereby the Logos makes himself directly to be the subject of human attributes and experiences. Now, Paul Gavriliuk would like to say more than this with respect to self-emptying. He finds in Cyril the affirmation of what he calls temporary restraint of divine power in order to allow or permit the man Jesus to have human experiences humanly. The Logos, he says, quote, let his body suffer, unquote. The idea of an occasional restraint in the exercise of omnipotent power on the part of the Logos would most certainly yield a concept of kenosis which pushes beyond talk of a mere addition and it anticipates in a limited way some modern developments. I mean, that's really Gavriliuk's goal is to lessen the distance between Cyril and modern critics of Cyril. But such restraint does not mean that the Logos has submitted himself to human experiences. Only if the Logos were to actively receive these experiences into his own being and life could impassibility truly be qualified, as Gavrilia claims for Cyril. But that is something that he fails to substantiate in Cyril's writings. And in any case, a qualified impassibility would be passibility by any other name. It's like being almost married. 
Uvirlik's affirmation of a qualified divine impassibility and a qualified divine passibility in serial simply fades into incoherence. The tension created between the identity of the Christological subject, considered as an agent of willed activity, and the identity of the Christological subject when made the object of the communication of attributes, was not resolved at Chalcedon in a studied way, but only accidentally, as it were. Accidentally because the bishop sim simply did not address the issue of the communication of attributes, which meant that the only identification of the person of the union, the only answer given to the question, who is the subject, was the preexistent eternal logos. That omission also made it certain that the tension would reemerge as soon as later theologians once again took up the intricacies of the communication of attributes more directly. The Council of Chalcedon was dominated by the Cyrilene party. To be sure, this party was under considerable pressure from the Emperor Marcion to come to conclusions that would be acceptable in the West, given the instability of political conditions in the East at the time. Leo's tome was affirmed at the Council, but only because, and here again this underscores the fact that the majority of bishops were Cyrilene, Leo's tome was affirmed, but only because it was judged by the bishops finally to be compatible with Cyril's theology. Cyril's theology was the test case. One, one phrase only in the Chalcedonian definition was lifted from Leo's tome, namely, the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single prosopon, unquote. But, as McGuckin has shown, the language of coming together can also be found in Cyril's writings, as can the insistence on the preservation of the properties of each nature in their original integrities subsequent to their uniting. More significant, however, is the insistence upon a single hypostasis which is explicitly identified with, quote, one and the same only begotten Son, God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ, unquote. That affirmation, combined with the explicit affirmation of the Theotokos and the equally explicit rejection of the two sons Christology of Theodore and Nestorius, made the victory of the Cyrilene party clear. The decrees of the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which met in Constantinople in 681 to resolve the Diothelite controversy, were undoubtedly intended as a deepening and clarifying of Chalcedon's significance in, re in relation to the controverted questions. But the effect of this later council was at the same time to make it possible to read Chalcedon more nearly in the light of Leo the Great's commitments than those of Cyril, which has often been done in the modern period, for example, by Grillmeyer, Pelican, and Brian Daly. The Sixth Ecumenical Council opted not only for two wills, but said rather expansively that there are in Christ, quote, two natural principles of action in the same Jesus Christ our Lord and true God, that is, a divine principle of action and a human principle of action, according to the godly speaking Leo, who says most clearly, and here they quote him, for each form does in a communion with the other that activity which it possesses as its own, the word working that which is the words and the body accomplishing the things that are the bodies, unquote. Such a commitment does not constitute a break with the instrumentalization of the human nature, which is needed to preserve both divine impassibility and to promote divinization soteriology, but it does make things rather more complicated than they were in Chalcedon. Jesus is now very much acknowledged as a self-activating human being. I would myself regard that as a positive step since it is hard to imagine how a human being who is not self-activating could possibly be truly human. After all, even Jesus' obedience to the will of his Father could only be genuine human obedience if it were self-activated. So if you think back to McGuckin's description of Cyril's claim 
that the human nature is not self-activating but is the instrument of an omnipotent power, it doesn't quite mesh with the Sixth Ecumenical Council's emphasis on diothelitism. The bishops at Constantinople also took the step of identifying the person itself as composite in nature rather than simply identifying the person with the pre-existent logos, which is a direct challenge in its way, however unintended, to Cyril's identification of the performative agent with the logos as such. The person is composite. Quoting the uh, Sixth Ecumenical Council, we acknowledge that the miracles and the sufferings are of one and the same person. According to one or the other of the two natures out of which he is and in which he has his being as the admirable Cyril said, unquote. To be sure, Cyril did indeed acknowledge the person to be composite, but only when he was thinking about the subject of the communication of attributes. But as we've already seen, that side of Cyril's thought had not found its way into the Chalcedonian definition. The fact that, he do, that it does so now is a clear demonstration of the fact that the problem of the communication of attributes is now very much in the forefront of the thinking of the bishops at Constantinople. And yet, the instrumentalization remains as the aftermath of Constantinople proved. John of Damascus, writing between 743 and 749, says the following, and I quote, the word of God is united to the flesh by the intermediary of mind which stands midway between the purity of God and the grossness of the flesh. And he continues, the mind has authority over both soul and body, but whereas mind is the purest part of the soul, God is the purest part of the mind. And when the mind of Christ is permitted by the stronger, that means the logos, then it displays its own authority, it functions in a normally human way. However, the human mind is under the control of the stronger and follows it, doing those things which the divine will desires." Unquote. The basic commitment which allows for instrumentalization is clearly the belief that the Logos acts through and upon his human nature, making it to be his tool or instrument. The Logos is either active in relation to the human nature or he permits it to be self-activating, but under no circumstances is he receptive in relation to it. And so a real communication of human attributes to the Logos is ruled out of court. The communication of the human to the person of the union is defined as a communication to the whole Christ, not to the Logos as such. Again, quoting John. In the case of the person, whether we name it from both of the parts or from one of them, we attribute the properties of both natures to it. To what? To the, to the God human in his divine human unity. And thus Christ, he continues, which name covers both together, is called both God and man, created and uncreated, passable and impassable, unquote. For John of Damascus, the subject to whom attributes are ascribed is, quote, the one composite person, unquote, of Christ. What are we to make of this remarkable development? Whether in the stronger form taught by Cyril or in the more modest form taught by John of Damascus, an instrumentalization of the human nature by the Logos constitutes a Christology which, on the face of it, is worlds removed from the New Testament attestation of Jesus. Certainly, the Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels, in particular, needs the endowment of the Holy Spirit given in his baptism in order to carry out his mediatorial activity. And it is here that we really begin to feel the pinch. Why should Jesus need to be equipped with the Holy Spirit in his baptism if it is the case that the second person of the Trinity has, from his very conception, made him to be his own omnipotent instrument? Why is it necessary for the Holy Spirit to drive Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted in Mark 1.12? The Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels looks very much like a man indwelt by the Holy Spirit in relation to whom he remains ontologically other, just as you and I as believers are. <clears throat> 
in relation to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit indwells us, but we're not incarnations of the third person of the Trinity. We are not hyp hypostatically united to him. So if hypostatic union had to mean that the Logos acts omnipotently through the man Jesus, the Holy Spirit would have been rendered superfluous to requirements. Indeed, he ought to have been sacked, i.e. declared redundant, since the job he's trying to do is already being done by the Logos. And even if we tried to read the Gospels canonically, it's a lot easier to read John in the light of the synoptics than to read the synoptics in the light of John. In any event, there is no revealed answer to the question which gospel or gospel should provide the starting point for an attempt to read synthetically. There's no real revealed answer to that problem. This is not at all to say that hypostatic union is an impossible thought. It's only to say that hypostatic union will have to be understood in such a way that we are able to give due weight to all of the gospels and not just to one of them. But even now, we have yet to name the most fundamental problem. The unseen and not so unseen guest presiding over the whole of the development of the Orthodox Christology through all of its phases is the extra biblical idea of divine impassibility. It is impassibility which makes it impossible to think of a real communication of human suffering to the Logos. And that, I, I would suggest, is the source of the tension which we have observed between making the Christological subject to be the Logos, as in the main strand of Cyril's thought, as well as in the Chalcedonian formula, and making the Christological subject to be the whole Christ, the divine human, the God human in his divine human unity, as in the other strand of Cyril's thought, as well as in the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Given the commitment to impassibility, the, the subject to whom human predicates are ascribed had to be the whole Christ. And the communication had to be treated as figural. There simply was no other option if you're going to preserve impassibility. But that then meant that the person in which the natures are said in Orthodox Christology to subsist is a real subject only so long as it is considered as itself acting. At the point at which it ought to have been considered as acted upon, as receiving human predicates and experiences, the person of the union ceased to be a concretely existing subject altogether. In fact, it became an absolute metaphysical subject, utterly devoid of content, a kind of metaphysical buffer between two natures whose sole purpose was to prevent the divine nature from being contaminated by the human nature. And to the extent that this happened, then the two natures, each now understood to be possessed of their own minds, wills, and energies of operation, mind you, in the Sixth Ecumenical Council, begin to look very much like two concretely existing subjects. Two subjects, not one. My contention is that this vacillation between a single subject and a two subjects Christology was made unavoidable by the commitment to impassibility. It also made Orthodox Christology untenable in the long run. So I made the claim at the beginning that modern objections to Chalcedon lay their finger on problems that had been there all along. Modernity did not create the problems. It simply made them clearer. So I turn to the second section two failed strategies for defending Chalcedon in 19th century Germany, Tomasius and Dorner. By the 1840s, theologians in Germany were acutely aware of the intractable problems <coughs> created by Orthodox Christology in its historical development. A turning point came with the publication of David Friedrich Strauss's Christliche Glaubenslehre in 1840 and 1841 a work in which the analysis I've just offered in my first section was laid out in great detail and to devastating effect. After that, no one was willing to defend Chalcedon unchanged. Modifications were introduced in an effort to preserve its core values. 
Two strategies emerged which dominated the discussion for the next three decades. The first was the canonic Christology of Gottfried Thomasius, which has undergone a revival in recent evangelical theology. The second was the idealistic Christology of Isaac August Dorner. Both Thomasius and Dorner were traditional Lutherans, committed not only to Chalcedon, but also to the so-called genus of majesty, a subclass of the communication of attributes devised by their 16th century forebears in the Lutheran tradition. Briefly stated, the idea in the phrase the genus of majesty is that the chief consequence of the hypostatic union of natures in Christ is a communication of the attributes of the divine majesty, which is to say omnipotence, omniscience, and omnipresence to the human nature of Christ. Now the authors of the formula of Concord in 1577 took great care to insist that the properties of the divine nature are not made essential to the human nature. Moreover, it was held that in the state of humiliation, the human nature merely shares in these attributes of the divine majesty when and where God wills, for example, in the transfiguration, and only enjoys full use of these attributes of the divine majesty in the exaltation. It was this, ver this Lutheran version of Chalcedonian orthodoxy which Thomasius and Dorner set out to defend. We may begin with Thomasius. <coughs> Thomasius' version of the canonic Christology is the version you're all familiar with. It involves a divestment of divine attributes, and that's what most people think of when they think of canonic Christology these days. So Thomasius is the origin of all that. Gottfried Thomasius, whose dates are 1802 to 1875, was a member of the Erlangen School in Bavaria, north of Munich a group of talented theologians which also included J.C.K. von Hofmann, famous biblical scholar and theologian. Where Christology was concerned, it was Thomasius who took the leading role. Thomasius' initial move was to equate the subject of the kenosis spoken of in Philippians 2.7 with the Logos Asarkos, so that self-emptying was made to be an ontological precondition to incarnation. In what, in what then did the self-emptying itself consist? Tomasius held that the kenosis of the Logos consisted in the surrender of what he called those relative attributes which God only acquired as a consequence of his free decision to create a world. God, he argued, is not essentially omnipotent, omniscient, or omnipresent. He is these things only in relation to a freely created world. So these attributes are relative. Therefore, the Son could surrender these attributes without ceasing to be God. Only the imminent attributes could not be surrendered, which includes the absolute power of self-determination, truth, holiness, and love. Now, it's clear what Tomasius hoped to achieve with this innovative interpretation of kenosis. He was hoping to create space within the Chalcedonian model for a normally functioning human consciousness in Jesus, for a human personality capable of growth and development. But in order to get there, he also felt it necessary to posit the surrender by the Logos of his divine self-consciousness. Quoting Tomasius, this kenosis must necessarily reach to the divine self-consciousness. For if, as God, he did not truly have a human consciousness, he did not have a truly human consciousness, if he did not know, feel, sense himself altogether as man, then he is for us no brother. He's not like us in all things. He's lacking precisely that which makes him to be a high priest who is able to suffer and to feel with us." Unquote. In back of this claim lies the supposition, and it's one he shared with Strauss, interestingly enough, that divine self-consciousness and human self-consciousness cannot coexist in a single person. Either would cancel the other out. 
For if the person we call Jesus Christ had both a divine mind and a human mind, then, according to, Ma to Tomasius, he knew all things by an immediate act of intuition, the divine mind, and he knew only some things and knew them as we know them, namely success successively. And so the surrender of, of omniscience had to mean the surrender of divine self-consciousness. Again, quoting Tomasius, his divine self-consciousness has to become a human consciousness in order as human consciousness to unfold his divine essence and his divine majesty, unquote. It's also clear that Tomasius is deferring the full functioning of the Lutheran genus of majesty to the state of exaltation. He's pushing it off to the eschaton. The human nature of Christ does not share in the attributes of the divine majesty during the days of his earthly ministry. Participation in those attributes can only begin at the point at which the Logos takes up what he had once surrendered once again, which means in the exaltation. What Tomasius winds up with is the ancient onhypostasia without the later diothelitism. That is to say, the human nature of Christ has no prior independent existence, but is made to subsist in the Logos' own being. And that's the basic meaning, as I suggested earlier, of onhypostasia. But the Logos has been stripped of his divine self-consciousness. He is no longer personally present to the man Jesus, but present only as the impersonal ground of his being. Again, quoting Tomasius, from the act of the unio hypostatica onwards, there really can be no talk of two distinct natures, of a twofold consciousness, of a twofold will. Rather, it is the one undivided person of the God-man, una indivisa persona, in which divinity and humanity so penetrate each other that neither exists for itself." Unquote. It's somewhat ironic, given the fact that Tomasius set out to defend Chalcedon, that he wound up in much the same place his liberal opponents had, namely, with the affirmation of a man who is God completely stripped of divine consciousness, all that's left is a man which subsists in divine being, but only in an impersonal way. By the way, most of these close reflections on canonic Christology that I'm trying to give you right now, you won't find in any discussion of it in contemporary evangelical literature seeking to defend Logos, uh, to, to defend canonic Christology. You just won't find it. And the problems which I'm about to, to raise, that Dorner himself puts his finger on, are never addressed, ever. It's almost as if Dorner's just unknown. So we'll pass to him. The arch-critic of Tomasian canonicism was I.A. Dorner, professor of theology in Königsberg, Bonn, Göttingen, and finally in Berlin. You, it's like New York, you know, you really know you've made it when you get all the way to Berlin. So Dorner was big time. Dorner was, in my judgment, the finest dogmatic theologian in Germany in the period between Schleiermacher and Barth. He was the leading figure in the so-called mediating theology, a group of theologians who sought not only to mediate between the Christian tradition and the modern world, but also, interestingly enough, between Schleiermacher and Hegel. In 1846, Dorner published a very critical review of Tomasius' contributions to, to ecclesial Christology. That's what got this whole argument off the ground. According to Dorner, if the Logos were to have divested himself of his divine consciousness, he would at the same time have divested himself of that divine love, which is the motive force of the whole of the mediator's reconciling and act activity and redeeming activity. And given that Tomasius had identified the divine love as belonging to the essence of God, the latter's claim, Tomasius claim to restrict divestment to relative attributes, which the Logos has only as a consequence of creating, fails to be sustained. Dorner saying, you can't strip the Logos of his divine consciousness and still have the divine love in place. And if you don't have the divine love in place, then you've actually eliminated an essential attribute on Tomasius' own definition. Dorner says this, Herr Dr. Tomasius, crashes on these rocks 
Or is the love which John identifies with God's essence still possible if the Logos gives up his divine consciousness? One can, with justification, say that the writer, Tomasius, has caused the Logos to surrender his essence as well." Unquote. In a later work, Dorner would add that the surrender of the divine consciousness, since it is essential to the Logos as God, would also have profoundly negative consequences for the doctrine of the Trinity. For it would result in both theopascitism and subordinationism. Theopascitism, because the being of God has been transformed into that of a human, and subordinationism, because the Son would no longer be equal to the Father and the Spirit during the days of his earthly ministry. The Trinity would be torn asunder by a kenosis of the kind described by Tomasius. And in any event, a divestment of divine attributes would turn God's self-revelation into a matter of appearance only. In other words, a theophany. By the way, if you read uh, Michael Gorman's book, Inhabiting uh, a Cruciform God, I think that's the title, you'll, you'll see him using the word theophany all over the place. But a theophany is not a self-revelation. A theophany is a temporary and provisional manifestation of God through some self-chosen creaturely medium with which God is not hypostatically united. Hypostatic union does not mean theophany. Dorner's own solution to the problems pointed to by Strauss looked in a rather different direction. In order to create space for psychological development in Jesus, Dorner posited a gradual uniting of the Logos with a human being. Hypostatic union, understood as an event that is complete in an instant, let's say in the conception of Jesus by the Holy Ghost, was replaced by Dorner with an ongoing hypostatic uniting. Now, while this might seem to open the door to adoptionism, since it's clearly a human subject with which the Logos is seen to be uniting himself, Dorner was much too astute to allow that to happen. He understood Jesus to be a special creation of God, a person created in the very act of initiating the process of uniting. The understanding of kenosis embedded in this conception is that of a voluntary, which is to say, freely willed restraint in self-communication to the man Jesus on the part of the Logos, a restraint in his self-communication to the person of Je to the man Jesus. In no way does Dorner's account involved divestment of anything proper to the Logos as a person of the Godhead. The, the process of uniting is only complete, Dorner says, in the exaltation. The result of this process is a single divine human person, what Dorner calls a theandric personality. What Dorner has done here, in effect, is to reject the Chalcedonian identification of the person of the union with the divine Logos, and with that, the onhypostasia of the human nature, in order then to make the diothelitism of the Sixth Ecumenical Council the basis for the gradual creation of a single divine human subject. The net effect of all of this is distinctively Lutheran, though it defers the full communication of divine attributes to the human nature to the state of exaltation. There is something rather odd about this, though. If, if it is said, and Dorner does in fact say this, that Jesus could not participate fully in the attributes of the divine majesty during the days of his earthly ministry without ceasing to be human, how then could this take place in the exaltation without producing the same result? Would it not stand to reason that human personality would be completely absorbed in originistic fashion into the divine personality in the eschaton, rather than producing a single divine human person, as Dorner claims? The problem here is, of course, that Dorner has made the Lutheran genus of majesty to be the ontological ground of the creation of what he calls a theandric person or subject. The human can never come fully into its own on this basis. It can only finally be eliminated, which is why he ends up with a kind of originistic absorption. <laughs>
Dorner has other problems as well, many of them having to do with the influence of Schelling on his account of the Trinity, but they need not detain us here. I'm sometimes surprised Webster never mentions that. He, he, he likes uh, Dorner as much as I do, but so far as I've been able to tell, the name Schelling never comes into play anywhere. Suffice it to say that Dorner's Christology at least opened the door to the possibility of understanding the hypostatic union as an actualistic uniting of divine and human persons. The obvious shortcoming here lies in the way the problem of the unity of person has been handled. If one does not find the genus of majesty to be an acceptable idea, and as a Reformed the theologian I do not, then one will not be able to accept Dorner's solution to the problem of the unity of person either. Part three, reformed canonicism, an alternative building upon Karl Barth and John Owen. I have suggested to this point that the orthodox tradition in Christology has been characterized by an, an inevitable and therefore unending vacillation between two quite different definitions of the Christological subject. The orthodox themselves cannot bring an end to this vacillation because Eastern theology operates under a twofold pressure, namely the preservation of divine impassibility on the one hand, which makes impossible a communication of human attributes to the Logos as such, and the soteriology of divinization, which leads to the need to have the Logos acting through and upon his human nature in a very direct manner. The Lutherans are in no better position since their genus of majesty is closely related to the divinization theory, and they too affirm impassibility. It is because Tomasius and Dorner remain committed to the genus of majesty that their theories didn't work either. Tomasius ending up with a theophany and Dorner with an originistic elimination of the human in the exaltation of Jesus. The Roman Catholics cannot resolve it either. Their commitment to the irreformability of magisterial teaching will always incline them to read Chalcedon in the light of Leo's tome, he was after all a pope, and the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which is to say with a strong emphasis on diotheletism without resolving the problem. If given a choice, I would always take the Sixth Ecumenical Council over Chalcedon's formulation as its proper interpretation like the Catholics do. But all I'm saying is that doesn't resolve the fundamental tension. And even Calvin never resolved it. He too remained committed to divine impassibility, which meant that he had to understand the communication of human attributes uh, as being to the whole Christ, not to the Logos as such. It seems to me that there can be no way forward out of this impasse which does not entail the surrender of the concept of divine impassibility. If we were to eliminate impassibility, then we could understand the communication of attributes to run in both directions, from the divine nature to the person of the union, and from the human nature to the person of the union. To put it this way is to suggest that the Christological subject is not the Logos as such, but the Logos made flesh a composite person. Now talk of a composite person is traditional, obviously. We came across it in relation to the Sixth Ecumenical Council. But the use I propose to make of it here is certainly not traditional. Traditionally, the meaning of that phrase was that the Logos makes his own that which takes place in the human nature in the sense of possessing it. I'm suggesting that we understand the communication realistically, such that human suffering is received by the Logos and taken up into his own being. Realistic communication as a theological move finds its ground in what I would like to call the ontological receptivity of the Logos ontological receptivity of the Logos. Receptivity as his way of being in the world. Now, ontological receptivity would mean change, mutability, if the being of the Logos were not eternally a being precisely for this outcome in time. And so, this adjustment in Christology cannot stand alone. It must be accompanied by the understanding that the eternal divine election it simply is the life back of God. It's the act in which God constitutes himself as God. 
Election is thus the ontological ground of Christology, even as Christology is the epistemological ground of election. The logos, I am suggesting, relates to his human nature in the mode of receptivity. Not once in a while, not occasionally, but consistently, constantly. For this is his way of being. Does this move then entail the suppression or elimination of the divine will? Well, it's quite true that this move would make the performative agent of all that is done by the God human in his divine human unity to be the man Jesus acting in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it might well seem that if I were to affirm diothelitism, I would have done so only theoretically. Functionally, I would have suppressed, if not eliminated, the divine will and activity. My good friend, my Dominican friend, Thomas Joseph White, has made this suggestion to me in conversation. But that is not the case. Receptivity is itself willed activity. It's a fully self-conscious willed action. The Logos wills to, to act and experience human life humanly. That he does not cease to be God in doing so goes without saying. The meaning of his infinite self-consciousness is not that it is contradicted by the assumption of a finite self-consciousness, which grows and develops normally. The meaning is rather that infinite self-consciousness encloses and embraces Jesus' finite self-consciousness in itself without ceasing to be what it is. The space, if I can put it that way, given to human personality for growth and development is a space in the being of God. And it is given not through divestment of anything proper to God, as with Tomasius, but through an internal determination not to act through or upon human nature. That this Christology that I'm proposing resolves problems endemic to the Orthodox tradition is not the main reason for its adoption, however. The main reason has to do with its capacity to more adequately explain the full range of New Testament testimony. We may start once again, as we did on Thursday, with one of the earliest Christologies in the New Testament, the so-called Christ hymn of Philippians 2, 6 through 11, in order then to ask what sense it might make of other Christologies. It seems to me that the church fathers were indeed right to regard the pre-existent son as the subject of the self-emptying spoken of in Philippians 2, 7. Self-emptying is an activity which is explained by the phrase taking the form of a slave. Seen in this light, self-emptying refers to the act of incarnation. Whether this act is rightly construed as one which takes place in an instant of time, in the conception of the Holy Spirit, or as one which takes place in an eternal act of ontological identification with Jesus, if I can put it that way, by means of which the eternal son joins himself to the being of, of Jesus the man in every moment of his lived human existence, is a question which cannot be resolved on the basis of this passage in Philippians 2 alone. But now, the subject of the eternal act of self-emptying is said in verse 5 to be Christ Jesus. Faced with this naming of the one who empties himself, we might wish to ask, how can Christ Jesus be the subject of an eternal act through which he becomes Christ Jesus, a God-human in his divine human unity? That is, in fact, a Trinitarian problem, which I will take up in the second lecture today. Suffice it here to say that I do not believe that Philippians 2 offers us any real option but to see Christ Jesus as the subject of the eternal act of self-emptying. The humbling spoken of in verse 8, then, is something which can only take place because Christ Jesus now exists in a human form. This humbling is not identical with self-emptying, but refers instead to the way of Christ to the cross. It's a description of the human existence of Christ Jesus through the days of his earthly existence. Now, how does this help us with other strands of the New Testament witness to the person of Christ? The relation to the synoptic picture of Jesus is quite clear and easily defended. The synoptic Jesus does what he does in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And Simon Gathercole has made a compelling case for a largely assumed pre-existence of the sun in the synoptics through close analysis of the I have come to sayings in all three synoptic gospels against the background of angelic figures who employ this phrase in contemporary Jewish literature to explain the purpose of their coming to the human realm. How the sun pre-exists, on the other hand, what his constitution might be as the pre-existing one, is, according to Gathercole, a subject which is left untreated in the Synoptic Gospels. What is clear is that the numerous I have come plus purpose sayings implies a purposive will in the pre-existent Christ. This is perhaps the most important theological implication of the pre-existence Christology in the synoptics, that they point to the will of the Son in entering the human realm. The will expressed in these sayings is to do the work of redemption, which also suggests strongly that the identity of the one so willing is already defined by the intention contained in that will. Thus, we're not dealing here with an eternal son who possesses an identity in abstraction from the intention expressed in that will, and we would do well to name the subject of that will in Christ Jesus, as Paul does. I have already discussed the so-called high Christologies of John and Hebrews in my fourth lecture on Thursday. Suffice it here to repeat, it is Jesus Christ who is named as the agent of creation in Hebrews 1-2. And if that is the case in Hebrews, then it is likely also to be the case in John 1.3. And given the identification of the pre-existent Son with Christ Jesus in Philippians 2, 5 through 7, we are not surprised to find that Paul makes explicit his belief that creation took place through Jesus Christ, explicitly named, in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Colossians 1.16 is to the same effect. <coughs> Now, in my last lecture, I postponed the question of what it means to speak of creation as having taken place through Jesus Christ. Does it confer a merely ideal existence to the one spoken of this way, an existence in the mind or plan of God, as if to say, the one God created heaven and earth to be the theater of his redemptive activity in Jesus Christ, so that Jesus Christ is understood as the reason for creation and its telos? Or does it mean that he is somehow real prior to his coming into this world? It seems to me that the answer to that question given in Paul's writings, and especially in the Gospel of John, is unequivocal. Jesus Christ pre-exists as a real, concretely existing subject prior to entering this world. Gather Cole argues that the same is true for the synoptic evangelists. But if Jesus Christ pre-exists his coming into this world, how does he pre-exist? Again, as I said earlier, the New Testament writers are very reserved in their statements on this theme. And yet we have come a long way towards finding a biblically responsible answer in the identification itself. The Son of God is Jesus Christ, both before becoming in flesh and after. That is to say, his identity is already, in eternity, defined by that which he will become in taking on flesh. He is no other in himself than he is for us in time. But if that is the case, then it lies close to hand to think that already in eternity, Jesus Christ does what he does in the same way he would do things in time, namely in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is to say, Jesus Christ is not directly the effective agent of creation. He acts in the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he does, both before and after his incarnation. This is, I would argue, a more natural way to understand the prepositions employed by John, Paul, and the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews in speaking of Christ as the medium of the Father's creative activity in the power of the Holy Spirit. That is, that all things are made through him, Dia, in John 1.3, 1 Corinthians 8.6, and Hebrews 1.2. It also makes reasonably good sense of creation in him, as Colossians 1.16 has it. Better sense by far than thinking of Christ as the direct agent of creation. Let me just make one more observation which will help to fill out my Christological proposal. The New Testament knows nothing of divine and human natures, 
That is a concept borrowed from philosophy to speak of common features found in all members of a class. The New Testament writers narrate the identity of Jesus Christ in the form of a history, the lived history of obedience to his Father's will. A dogmatic Christology which is faithful to this way of thinking will not think in terms of essences which can be defined in abstraction from the history of Jesus Christ. And that means too that his person is concretely realized in God's identification of himself, of his being, with the history of this one human being. Concretely realized, not constituted for the first time. I'll come back to this in the next lecture. If Jesus Christ pre-exists his incarnation in any sense, then it will not be possible to say that his person is constituted by his lived historical existence. What is constitutive, what's truly constitutive, is his eternal election for this concrete realization. Conclusion. In this lecture, I have identified problems endemic to the Chalcedonian tradition. Problems created by a logically and historically prior commitment to divine impassibility. The problem I have pointed to is the shift in the definition of the Christological subject which takes place as the move is made from discussion of divinization soteriology to discussion of the communication of attributes. From making the logos to be the subject, the person of the union, to making the whole Christ to be the subject, the person of the union, compositely. I have resolved the vacillation occasioned by these commitments by making the logos as human to be the subject. That is to say, I have made appeal to an eternal and continuous act of ontological receptivity to be basic to the constitution of the logos as a subject, which means that there is no logos as such and never has been. The logos of John's gospel is Jesus Christ both in eternity and in time. Such a definition of the Christological subject is not only self-consistent, in that it is applied both to the Logos who is about to become incarnate and the Logos having already become incarnate. It also upholds all the core values of the Chalcedonian tradition. I would identify the core values of that tradition as consisting in an affirmation that one and the same subject is truly God and human. The categories by means of which the bishops of Chalcedon brought this theological value to expression were themselves extra-biblical and as such not sacrosanct. And therefore fidelity to Chalcedon does not have to mean acceptance of its categories. It consists rather, fidelity consists in the maintenance of the core theological values of the bishops, which thankfully did not include on that occasion the soteriology of divinization, thankfully for us Protestants. I cannot emphasize this strongly enough. I'm not rejecting Chalcedon. I'm trying to improve it. I'm trying to overcome its endemic problems. I'm trying to uphold in a thoroughly Protestant fashion its core values. To be honest, I think that the Christological model I have proposed here has the potential, at least, for overcoming the breach that currently exists in New Testament studies between the Christologies of Matthew, Mark, and Luke on the one hand and the Christologies of John, Paul, and Hebrews on the other. It also has the potential of overcoming the breach between ancient and modern Christologies. For in upholding the core values of Chalcedon, while offering a distinctively modern Christology, I think I have shown a way to move beyond the impasse that is inevitably created when supporters of modern theology demonize the ancient church and its teachings, or when supporters of the ancient church do the same to the modern church and its teachings. I describe my model as having the potential for overcoming this twofold breach because in order to be truly successful, it would have to achieve widespread acceptance. And for that to happen, there would need to be a lengthy period of interdisciplinary testing of it. And obviously, I have no control over such a process. What I can do is use, now use my, as the economic basis for a revised doctrine of the Trinity, uh, my model, excuse me, I can, what I can do is use my model as the economic basis for a revised doctrine of the Trinity and a revised account of God's being and attributes. My contention in the two lectures which remain will be that nothing should be said of God which exceeds the limits imposed by this biblically responsible Christology.
Should we seek to do so, we will be operating not on the basis of Holy Scripture, but on the basis of other sources, which is to say on the basis of natural theology. And were that to happen, there would be no sola left to our affirmation of the authority of Scriptura. Thank you very much for your attention. Now to make your way to those. If I understand correctly, uh, you made the comment that in your model, uh, the space for the development of and personality is moved to God Himself and His being. Um, I'm wondering if you could flesh that out a little bit, say a little bit more about that and what that looks like, um, and what as well uh, how to avoid immutability in that. How to avoid immutability or mutability? Immuti uh, mutability. All right. Um, the creation of space has to do with the logos relating to his human nature receptively, which is another way of saying he doesn't act upon it or through it. Okay. In allowing the spirit to be the motive power for all that the man Jesus, Jesus does, the value of the hypostatic union is it makes that spirit indwelt Jesus to be an event in God's own life. The other day I said, what I was, after, I was after is a pneumatologically driven two natures Christology. I don't want to set aside hypostatic uniting. I, I tend to understand it like Dorner did in actualistic terms. But um, nonetheless, I want to retain the logic of Chalcedon precisely so that this can be an event in God's own life. But I want to understand what Jesus does in a way that it, it takes account of all the Gospels and not just one. And so therefore, Jesus does what he does in the power of the Spirit. How does this not introduce mutability? What Jesus does in time is determined by God's own being in eternity. If God has his being in the act of election for this outcome, then he is already, by way of anticipation, what he will become in time. He is unchangeably that which he is in that eternal act. Because it's that eternal act that defines what mutation would mean, a deviation from a being as this God in this eternal act. Is that clear? and human natures and everything we are to say of God is to be set on the basis of Jesus' history. Mm -hmm. um, we know that Jesus grew in stature and in favor of human beings. You apparently think that he grew in his self-consciousness and maybe even emotional maturity. How do we know that that isn't part of the divine nature rather than the human? Or, or how would you parse that since we're no longer using nature language? How do we know that that's not divine? Well, because in the context in Luke, he's talking, it's talking about the man Jesus. Well, everything in the Gospels is about the, the single subject who is the man Jesus Christ, is it not? Uh, everything is about the man Jesus. When you introduce the language of subject, you are now addressing very directly, as I did too, the question of the ontological constitution of the mediator, which is not a question that the New Testament writers take on directly. What they say has implications for how we go about addressing such a question. But when you say they're referring to the subject, who is the man Jesus, then that already operates at a certain remove from exegesis itself. You're already doing dogmatics. I guess the question is, if, if it's all about the subject, Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. how do we know what to predicate of God in his life, and how do we know what not to so predicate? In other words, does God grow in stature, does God emotionally mature? I think that, uh, and, I, and I'm sure you would agree with me, that growing in grace and knowledge of God is something that is described contextually to Jesus. And on the basis of the model I'm proposing, one can understand that as an event in God's own life, which has not been done before, as far as I can tell. So it's not removed from that which we need to say about the eternal constitution of the second person of the Trinity. It's not separated from it. 
I think, I think this model has the potential, thirdly, I mentioned two things, of holding together eternity and time in a much more coherent fashion so that eternity doesn't drift off into timelessness and spacelessness. <clears throat> Just trying to get my head around some of the things you've been saying. Is this mm -hmm. on? Um, to say that the one we have come to know as Jesus Christ is pre-existent is surely different to saying that the, one, that the historical individual Jesus Christ is pre-existent. Yeah. Otherwise, one is taking humanity back into the eternal Godhead before the ascension. Yeah. How, how does one distinguish those two? I said the other day that the Logos does not bring his body with him from heaven. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what does it mean to act humanly before you have a body, before you're hypostatically united to human nature? Well, on the basis of my model, I can say the Logos acts eternally the same way he acts in time, through the Spirit. There's no, there's no difference whatsoever from the standpoint of who and what the Logos is as subject to how he acts in eternity and how he acts in time. In both cases, it's by the Spirit. So ontological receptivity is a description of the Logos not only in flesh, but the Logos as incarnandus, as the one who acts through the Spirit in eternity. Now, why don't, why don't I see if that makes any sense to you, if you want to push back a little bit, and, and then I can see. Well, th then it seems to me what you're doing is um, making <clears throat> the activity of the Holy Spirit somehow um, linked to what it means to be human. Um, the Holy Spirit, as I said earlier, is not hypostatically united to human beings, not to us as believers, not even to Jesus. It remains ontologically other as it indwells. Therefore, the Spirit's activity remains distinct from human activity, but human activity is empowered by it, um, made possible by it, in a way that pleases God. Uh, that's not a new idea. That's very traditional. That's very scriptural. Just a slightly, another question in mind, really. Um, if I follow what you're saying, does it not also um, follow that um, with this sort of divine self-election that the willed, uh, God then becomes contingent on the world for in order for him to be this in the person of his son? I'm going to address that question okay. thoroughly in the next lecture. I'll wait till then. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Bart says, God is a human God. God has a human face. It's a very Jewish face. That doesn't mean that he brings that face with him into the incarnate state, but he has an eternal determination of being for that outcome. And therefore, he already is a human God, a very gracious God from eternity to eternity, unchangeably so. Sure. Yes. Yes, uh, thank you for the lecture. Um, your terminology, um, ontological receptivity, uh, functions well within your framework as an abstraction of a concept. It's a concept that intends to explain how is it that the one subject receives all the attributions of humanity. Yeah. It seems also that you're working with an atemporal view of divine being. Um. Eternity is not time, but eternity is the logical moment that founds time and comprehends it in itself. So it's not timelessness, but it's not time as we know it either, but it's not unconnected to time. And that's as far as you can go. Yeah, that, that in itself is not very helpful, <laughs> but anyway. It uh, timelessness all hollow. Okay. Because but, su such a God couldn't do anything in this world. Mm -hmm. that, that might be another issue, but um, um, Leonardo Boff charges uh, Moltmann's panentheism with the capacity to sustain or eternalize suffering. Mm -hmm. I wonder how your ontological receptivity as a way, as an alternative to immutability and saying it is mutable, God is mutable, uh, does not do the same. If there is an absorption of complete human attributions, mm 
then how is it that God, how is it that suffering in itself is not essentialized and therefore will not, will ever stop? Very good question. It, it, suffering cannot be eternalized in the sense of endless because it's a human event. And Jesus is raised from the dead, which brings a terminal end to the suffering. So as a human experience in God's own life, it can't be eternal in the sense of endless. And besides, eternity is not endless duration. It's not timelessness. So anyway, it's a human experience. We're, when we talk about suffering, we aren't talking about a divine experience that goes on for, from eternity to eternity. We're talking about an event in God's life that is human in character. So when, when people like Moltmann engage in a kind of language that sounds highly speculative and are then on that basis criticized for turning e suffering into something uh, eternal to the divine itself, there's a mistake there. Moltmann doesn't do, make the move I'm making here of, of, of insisting that suffering is simply something that takes place in the human nature of which God is the subject. He doesn't do that. And the, and the truth of the matter is Moltmann doesn't even have a crucified God in spite of the title because he doesn't have a two natures logic. He can't, he can't get suffering into God. If you read him closely, that's the case. He's got all kinds of problems with Chalcedon. As I said earlier, I'm trying to pr improve Chalcedon, not leave it behind. Yeah, uh, but, it's, but it seems then in, in your model, then suffering gets to God. Gets to, but does not overcome him. And the proof of that is the resurrection. Assuming that God is not in time. Yeah, God is affective. God has this human experience, but it, ha it is limited in its duration. Then God will be in time if it is limited in duration. God will be in time? Yeah. I hope he is. Because, because if, Otherwise, yeah. the incarnation didn't reach us. Then it's, I'm just saying, it, then it will be hard to conceptualize. God is not only in time. Is that what you're headed for? No, no. Because no, I'm not saying God is temporal as we know te time, no. God is the outside of time in the sense of the logical moment that founds time through turning towards this world in, in creation and redemption. Well, that might be a, I know this, this is your constructive part, that, that might be a, an aspect to work on because, I mean, some uh, philosophers of science and, and, uh, and dealing with the issue of time and eternity have pointed out many times the incoherence of, of, of possible incoherence or apparent incoherence of sustaining, trying to sustain timeless eternity while at the same time divine action in time. But I'm not trying to sustain, sustain timeless eternity. No, I'm Whatever just saying that that might if, be if something If you're accurately that, reporting what they're, what they're criticizing, it has nothing to do with me that I can see. Well, it might, but anyway. Thank, thank you, thank Jules. You. Yeah. One more question, I think we have time for. Just a short question. Um, I'm curious if you can uh, redefine or give some qualification to the doctrine of uh, divine impassibility and then re reintroduce that to, back to the doctrine of Trinity, what would you say? Or do you think that we should abandon that altogether? I would, I would dispense with it as quickly as I would dispense with simplicity. I don't see how anyone can maintain that in the light of passages like 1 Corinthians 2.8, the Lord of glory was crucified. I just don't understand that. It's an abstraction. It has its source elsewhere, somewhere other than the New Testament witness. Well, uh, we have next lecture at 4 p.m. And uh, we have a few minutes for refreshment and fellowship in between. So let's thank uh, Professor McCormack for his lecture.